Good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, if, and, and thank all of you that are viewing from home. Uh, some of you may be viewing from home because your basements are flooded. I don't know where you're watching from, but here in the valley, we just got dumped on yesterday. And um, things are just a soggy mess here. And, um, but f for all of you, yes, sir. Uh, it's not streaming. All right. We're getting a message up here, Tyler, that Revelation is not streaming. We good? Shall I go on? It is streaming. Okay. Have your wife turned the TV on? <laughs> it's black. <laughs> I have it on the best authority that it is now streaming. So uh, thank you all at home uh, uh, for watching. Today we are going to step in to Revelation chapter 15. It is, if you've, if you've already read, it's the shortest chapter in the book of Revelation, and it introduces the seven angels with the seven last plagues. It introduces the bowls of wrath and God's completed outpouring wrath on the earth. It's just a scary, miserable, horrible chapter. Karen asked me, my wife Karen said, can we talk about something happy today in the book of Revelation? Is there anything happy? And I, I, I really can't find anything very happy except that we're, we're almost getting done with it. We're, we're getting closer to the end, but we, we just have to wade through the darkness um, until we get to chapter 19. We are just going to be in the darkness because in detail we are looking at the most terrifying days coming upon the earth. I want you to think about how terrifying it must have been in the days of Noah. Men and women were just going about doing their business mocking this old man who's built a boat in his backyard and then the rain came. Remember, it never rained until uh, Noah's flood. The earth was watered with a mist. It's a different world before the flood. What terror. When the fountains of the deep opened up, the windows of heaven crashed down. Uh, great tidal waves began to wash over the face of the earth. Men swept away. And then in the region where Noah lived, people banging on the door of that ark begging to come in for, for safety because God's wrath was unleashed upon the earth. It will be terrifying in the last days when instead of flood, it will be plague and fire in God's judgment upon the earth. There's, there's no way to make these scenes pretty, even palatable. It's just awfulness that we're about to view. So I just want to brace you for that. If there's good news, I'm going to tell you, I believe we're not going to be here for this last hour up on the earth. Uh, as I've told you before, I do believe the church enters into the tribulation. But um, for the bowls of wrath, this last hour, as we'll look at in a minute, I believe we're gone. So there, there's some good news uh, for you. Um, chapter 15 introduces chapter 16, where we actually have the bowls of wrath described. And as we'll read, it's with these bowls that, quote, God's wrath is completed. For centuries since the flood of Noah, God's wrath has been building against sinful men. The language here of God's wrath completed, it means what has been stored up is now 
poured out and his wrath will be absolutely spent upon the earth. The language might be in our vernacular, he's going to hold nothing back as he unleashes his wrath on the day of vengeance um, when, he, when, when he strikes down man's wickedness. Now, before we go on, we do have to do a little review of chapter 14. So I'm going to ask you to turn there in your Bibles. We, we, we did get through the whole chapter, but we went at a pretty good clip. Chapter 14 is John, John sees so many visions, uh, and, and it, it's coming at him. Rapid fire, it's out of time. He's just seeing in time's events uh, before they actually happen. John is getting a preview, so to speak, of what is about to happen in detail, in sequence. But in chapter 14, he's just seeing these quick visions. Although we got through them last, last time we were together, I, I, I do need to go back and add some commentary, some detail to them. And I want to begin in chapter 14, verse 6. So intriguing to me. Um, then I saw another angel flying midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live under, on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Whenever you see that language, whenever you see that description, this is everybody. Everybody on the earth is hearing this gospel proclaimed. The angel said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Before I go any further, would you circle the word hour? The hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of living and, and the springs of water. John is seeing three angels coming in succession with different messages. This first angel that appears and must terrify the people of the earth he is flying midair with the gospel. Last time we were together, we sort of laughed together at my suggestion that um, angels may be UFOs. Um, I, I do believe, I do believe that the best explanation of this phenomenon we're seeing of otherworldly crafts. I think even the Pentagon has said, we have no explanation for what we're seeing. They, what these, these flying objects we see defy aerodynamics as we understand them. Are we, in fact, seeing the beginning of angelic activity? And there's much angelic activity in the book of Revelation. Are, are we seeing that beginning now? Um, uh, we don't have time to talk about angels or the, the theology of angels, the study of angels through history, but we know they fly, they can appear mid-air. Ezekiel says they, they sometimes travel in craft, crafts, the wheel within a wheel. I don't know if you've had time to go back and look at Ezekiel. It's stunning, the description that Ezekiel has of the wheel within a wheel in this angelic craft. We know they visit men. They, they are announcers. They're announcing good news, bad news. And, and then in the last days, this angel appears midair. Now it's tempting, even in my mind, I, I, I can't get past the idea of a great winged, white-robed, flapping angel flying around, shouting to the men of the earth. Now that may be exactly what it is, but what if this angel is in a craft and he is speeding around the earth, quickly getting to his destination? And 
somehow supernaturally as only angels could do, announcing this bad news. Do you remember when the angels appeared um, to the shepherds in Bethlehem? Um, there was the announcing angel and then a host of angels. And it, it, it seems to be they appeared in the sky uh, speaking good news um, at that time. Now this angel will be announcing very bad news. But he's giving mankind a last chance to respond to the gospel. That's important. We talked about this last time. Very specifically, the first angel is announcing the gospel, the story of Jesus, the good news, the way of salvation, calling men to repent. And I referred last week, I will refer to it again, Matthew 24, verse 14. These are the words of Jesus. In response to the disciples' questions, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? One of the signs that Jesus gives of the end of the age is the gospel of the kingdom preached from Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Circle that, then the end will come. Jesus answers them very specifically. The question again, when will the end come? Well, the last thing that has to happen is the gospel of the kingdom proclaimed. Again, I don't mean any offense by this at all. At all. It's just a different opinion. I don't believe Jesus in Matthew 24, 14 is talking about human missionary effort. That Christ won't come back or the end won't come until missionaries in the church age have reached every nation, tribe, language. We, we of course, are, are extending the gospel through missionary effort around the world. But I believe Jesus is referring to the supernatural visitation by angels who make sure, sure, in the, re, in the most remote spots on earth, everyone hears. Well, then there are angel two and angel three yet to come. The second angel announces the fall of Babylon, still in, in Revelation 14. I skimmed this very quickly last week, and I may have uh, startled some of you when I said, and this is what I believe we're going to get in, into, who is Babylon? Uh, what is Babylon? I believe it is the counterfeit apostate church. Do you remember in the, in the letters to the churches, there's, there's the church of Laodicea. It's the, the last in the sequence of seven churches. I believe it represents the apostate church of the last age, uh, of the last days. It is so apostate that Jesus is on the outside trying to get in. He's knocking on the door to the church of Laodicea. And that church boasts they don't need anything. They are finely dressed. They have gold. They don't need anything, implying they don't even need Jesus. It is the apostate church of the last days. I believe apostate to the point. It is church in name only. It is not the spotless bride as we are, as, as we are described as today, the spotless bride of Christ without blemish. It is going to become the degenerate, soiled prostitute. Feminine, but prostitute. And I, I, will, I will say it again. This is, I think, what startled <clears throat> some of you. But again, it's, it's what I believe, that the headquarters of that apostate church is going to be wrong. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand or misconstrue that I'm suggesting today that the Catholic Church is the prostitute, the great whore of Babylon. I'm only saying that in later times, 
the headquarters of this apostate church, the prostitute, will be in Rome. And John has very specific clues, as we will see in later chapters, that it's going to be Rome. So please don't leave in saying, you know, Todd says that the great whore of Babylon is the Catholic Church. I'm not saying that. You know, uh, um, I, I could say, as I've said already about the church at Laodicea, the church at Laodicea represented Christian churches in, in the time of, of the apostles, in the time of John. I believe whatever that apostate church is going to be, I don't know that it will call itself Catholic or Protestant, just the church of the end times, the counterfeit church of the end times. Let me say it again and let it suffice to be only this. Its location, its headquarters will be Rome. The third angel uh, comes and announces that uh, woe to any of you that receive the mark of the beast. Um, judgment of, the judgment of God is coming quickly upon you. Repent that you have received that mark. And then, chapter 14, John sees this amazing vision of a crowned king coming on clouds of glory. And there are two harvests. The first harvest, gathered in with a sickle, is the wheat harvest. The second gathering is the clusters of grapes. The wheat harvest is a righteous harvest. We'll talk about the wheat harvest in a minute. And uh, as a farmer in, old, in, in John's time would go out with a sickle, the wheat would be gathered into sheaves and uh, bundled to where a man could carry it over his shoulder. They could be stacked up, these bundles of sheaves gathered uh, of wheat gathered in. And then there is the gathering in of the grapes. The grapes represent man's sin and God's judgment. You'll remember the languages, those grapes were thrown into the wine press of the fury of the wrath of God. And they are trampled outside the city. And as, the, as these grapes are broken and the juice spills out, it is representative of men's bodies trampled upon, great vast armies of the last days trampled upon by the Savior himself and their blood flows. So before we go on to chapter 15, can we discuss the great wheat harvest? Because it has to do with, with us, God's church. From Revelation 14, beginning in verse uh, 14. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head, a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to, to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Now the word gather is not there, but I want you to see it. The sickle, the sheaves, the, 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 com, the completed harvest of the earth gathered in. Sheaves gathered, collected, harvested, and I would say into the barn, as you'll see in a minute. The harvest of ripe wheat signals the end of the church age. What John is seeing here is the end of the church age. The church age began on the day of Pentecost. It has been continually at work. Missionaries, ministers, fellow Christians, all of us working the wheat field to bring in the harvest. There is coming a day in history when the church age will come to a sudden and abrupt end. The very last convert will um, give their life to Christ, 
perhaps some, even in that last hour, as the angel announces uh, for mankind to repent, maybe some will repent, but there will be an absolute end. The last, the last Christian will be born again and the age of the church will be finished. That door shut. As I mentioned, the uh, church began in Acts 2. I'll let you reference that on the day of Pentecost. You remember, again, very quickly, the apostles have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Tongues of fire, they rush out. And it just so happens that it is Shabbat. It is the Jewish feast of Passover, uh, of, of Pentecost, rather. I've been saying that wrong. Pentecost. Penta means five, 50 days after Passover. Um, celebrated the first gathering of wheat into barns. And it was a summer-long job. Pentecost is that first harvest. And it was upon the day of Pentecost, very specifically, on purpose, the church was born. The wheat harvest of souls has begun. And you'll remember in Acts 2, 3,000 souls gathered in to God's barn. The first converts to Christianity, the very first gospel message ever preached, ever preached. And what's the gospel? The gospel is the story of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. The apostles were told by Jesus, you go and wait in Jerusalem. And um, they went and waited. The Holy Spirit poured out on them and the gospel poured out of them. They were speaking in tongues and everyone gathered there for that feast from all over the world, representing different languages. They heard that gospel and the church was born. Let me give you a really quick um, little history lesson about Pentecost, the name Feast of Weeks, as it is some kind, sometimes called Shavat, was given because God commanded the Jews in Leviticus 23, 15 to, through 16, to count seven full weeks, 49 days, beginning on the second day of Passover, then present offerings of new grain to the Lord as a lasting ordinance. The term Pentecost, again, derives from the Greek word 50. Listen to Exodus 34, 22. Celebrate the festival of weeks with the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the festival of ingathering at the turn of the year from Leviticus 23. From <clears throat> the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, count of seven full weeks, <clears throat> excuse me, count off 50 days up to the day of the seventh Sabbath, then present the offering of new grain to the Lord. Wheat, a burnt offering to the Lord together with their grain offerings and drink offerings, food offering and aroma pleasing to the Lord. They are sacred offerings to the Lord for the priest. On that same day, you are to proclaim a sacred assembly, do no regular work. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come, wherever you live. When the uh, apostles rushed out midtown with the gospel for the first time, proclaiming that good news to all of those Jewish people who had traveled from all over the world. In the temple, at that moment, the priests were offering up as a burnt offering on the altar of God, wheat. They, they, were, they were burning wheat on that altar and the smell of that offering went up as a pleasant aroma to God at the very time that people were being baptized filled with the spirit born again the aroma of new life of the first harvest going up to the Lord as I mentioned uh, before, the church has been in the business of harvesting wheat for these 2,000 plus years. If you are a Christian here, if you are a Christian at home, you are wheat that has been harvested. You are part of the church born on Pentecost and in succession to the line of those first 3,000 millions, including you, have been born into that kingdom 
a pleasant aroma going up to the Lord of heaven. And there is a number, and only God knows the number, of wheat sheaves, grains of wheat that will be gathered in. Could we estimate today, how, what, what, what do you want to say, five million, two billion? I have no idea how many Christians have been born again since Pentecost. But a number that no one can count, we'll see in the book of Revelation, no one can count an innumerable number like the, the sands of the sea. But God knows when the last one will come in. Now, don't let this throw you, but we certainly represent the church age is best defined as Gentile, the Gentile church. On the day of Pentecost, those first converts were Jews. And the uh, ministry of the apostles early on was, was to the Jewish people. But in the days of the apostle Paul, uh, and what was Paul called? He was called the apostle to the, to the Gentiles. And he established Gentile churches. Now they got their foothold in Asia, probably from Jewish synagogues, but it soon spread into towns like uh, Corinth and, uh, and uh, 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 Ephesus in, into Gentile, that is non-Jewish um, communities, and the church was born. You are Gentiles, non-Jewish people, Gentile converts to Christ, wheat harvest. And the wheat harvest of the church age is best defined as the harvest of Gentile souls. The Jews soon turned their back to the gospel. Many of them reverted back to the law and the bondage of the law, Paul would say in Romans and Galatians, and the Holy Spirit has turned its attention uh, through the efforts of church to the Gentile world. When the full number of Gentiles has come in, God is going to turn his heart and his actions back to the Jewish people. I want you to turn to Romans 11. This is a verse we looked at um, months ago, but it's intriguing. This is the Apostle Paul, beginning in verse 25. I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery. Would you write that out? I mean, would you circle that, please? This mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you don't be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Paul writing to Rome, to the Gentile church at Rome, don't you be conceited. Don't you gloat that God has decided to turn his heart and his affection and his saving grace to you Gentiles. And don't you say, that God is absolutely finished with the Jewish people. By the way, historically, even today, Christians have said, and it is the seed of anti-Semitism, often springs from the church historically, God is done with the Jews. They crucified the Savior. The covenant promises he made to Abraham and to Isaac done. Not only is God done with the Jewish people, we shouldn't have anything to do with the Jewish people those Christ killers. It's really what spawned the hatred and bitterness uh, in Germany and created the Holocaust from Christian theology that God is done with the Jewish people. He is not done. He will never be done. The covenants that he established with Abraham were everlasting covenants. Paul says, don't gloat. The Jewish people have only experienced a hardening of their heart for a time. But when the full number of Gentiles has come in, he will turn his attention back to Israel. Now, it's not that God today doesn't love Jewish people. He does love Jewish people. Jewish people have been converted but the attention, again, of the Holy Spirit missionary effort has been into the Gentile world. 
Jewish people do have a hard heart, stubborn ears to hear. You know that if, if you've ever had, a, had experience trying to talk to a Jew uh, about Christ. Years ago, when I, I was in business for myself, I was, uh, I, I was um, at an establishment talking to the owner, the manager, and he was an American Jew. Now, he wasn't orthodox, he, um, but, but he was Jewish, had been in the Jewish Air Force, and now he's here managing an establishment, and he and I got into a discussion about Jesus. And the more we talked, going back and forth, I noticed that his office was sort of filling up. People were hearing our discussion, and they were walking in, and soon that office was filled with his staff, and we're going back and forth about the message of Jesus. He was very polite to me, and we, we had a, a good dialogue back and forth. But then he says to me, Todd, look, here's the deal. If you really could convince me that Jesus was the Jewish-born Son of God, the Savior of the world, I'm not going to believe it. I, I'm not going to accept it. Why wouldn't you? He said, well, it's not a good answer, but it is my answer. My family would disown me. If I became a Christian, my family would disown me, and I'm not going to pay that price. It's, uh, it's very difficult. Um, Jewish people, especially Orthodox Jews, have a hard time believing the gospel message. That doesn't mean we don't love them. That, do, that doesn't mean we... We cast them off. We should have a broken heart for the Jewish people. But they are presently stubborn, experiencing a hardness of the heart. I believe the vision that John saw of the wheat harvest gathered in is the end of the church age. The last Gentile will come in. John the Baptist predicted this from Luke chapter 3. Verse 16, John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with his unquenchable fire. Part of the end gathering of wheat is the winnowing of it. Uh, have any of you ever winnowed grain? Some of you know what that is. As the, as the, as the harvest is gathered in, uh, you take a winnowing fork, and on a breezy day, you throw the wheat up into the air, and the chaff, the, 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 the stick, the, the excess of the stalk is blown away, and the grain, the heavier grain, falls. John the Baptist had a vision, not only of the gathering into the barn, but of the winnowing of that wheat. And you would have two piles. You'd have the heavy wheat, the grain that fell, then you'd have the chaff. And what happened to the chaff? It was gathered up and burned. The uh, ingathering of the wheat always has had a connection with judgment. The righteous and the unrighteous, the righteous are judged to be right, and the chaff judge to be condemned. When does this gathering take place? This is very important, and I know you, you will feel like we have been here a dozen times, but I need to take a moment again just to say this. When does this gathering take place? The wheat gathering? the last Gentile to come in? When does the church age take place? Immediately after these three angels flying midair. In John's vision, the gathering takes place after the three angels have appeared, announcing the judgments of God, announcing what's coming. Repent, prepare yourself. All hell is about to break loose on the earth. And then John sees the vision the king on the cloud with the sickle 
and this ingathering. When, was, when will this take place? Not only when the full number of Gentiles comes in, but when the Antichrist is revealed at his coming and simultaneous with the wrath of God, the gathering of grapes, and the treading out of the winepress of the fury of God. Matthew 13, 38. I mentioned this last week, the parable of wheat and tares, the weed and the wheats, the weeds and the wheat. From Matthew 13, beginning in verse 38, Jesus explains the parable. The field is the world. The good seeds stand for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. When is the wheat gathered in? Very specifically, Jesus says it again, at the end of the age. Verse 40 of that same chapter, as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. Matthew 24, verse 31, this great prophecy of the last days from Jesus. We've looked at this time and again. I want to refer to it again. Jesus, just prior to verse 31, says, and, and then will be those great cosmic signs in the sky. The sun will, will turn dark. The moon will turn to blood. The, the, the stars of the sky will be shaken. And then verse 34, and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather. Same language, same image. They will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. When, according to Jesus, is this last in gathering of the wheat after the moon turns to blood and the stars fall from the sky? It is the last trumpet. And then this great in gathering. The Apostle Paul, again, a place we've been before, I just want to reference again. The Thessalonian Christians were confused. Some false teacher got in the middle of that mix and said, the day of the Lord's already happened, you missed it. They were wringing their hands. Paul writes them to comfort them and to correct this false idea. From 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Uh, verse 2. Um, no, I'm sorry, verse 1. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, that's a purposeful word that Paul is using. We ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be easily unsettled or alarmed by teaching allegedly from us, whether prophecy or by word or mouth or letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is re re revealed, the man doomed to destruction. If you can bear me repeating myself one more time, when is the man of lawlessness revealed? The abomination that causes desolation. Halfway through the tribulation, he appears in the temple proclaiming himself to be God. Paul saw it. Jesus predicted it. Daniel prophesied about it. Here again, Paul's language. Don't be deceived. That day will not come. We will not be gathered as you, you have been lied to. Some, someone, false prophet, someone in a letter asserting to come from us, scared you to death, that that gathering had already happened. No, it hasn't happened and it won't happen until after the man of lawlessness has been revealed. The weed harvest is completed at the end of the age. There's only one harvest, one gathering. Revelation 10, 6 through 8. Again, we touched on it briefly months ago. Let me reference it again here. A very interesting passage. Revelation 10, 
6 through 8. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, the sea, all that is in it, and said, there will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. This is very specific to me. When is the mystery accomplished, completed, fulfilled? It will be at that last trumpet. I believe, as I've stated before, that the resurrection trumpet of God, that angelic trumpet, is called the last trumpet, not because it sounds on the last day, but last because it's the last of a succession of trumpets. There's the first trumpet, the second, third, fourth, fifth, the last trumpet, the seventh trumpet. In the days of the last trumpet, the mystery of God will be revealed, or will be um, accomplished. And what is the mystery? The mystery is the church. The mystery is this unforeseen idea that God would turn his attention and his love and affection to Gentiles like us. And there's coming a day when it will be accomplished. The gathering will be complete. The last sheave gathered in just before he turns his attention to Israel. The church age will come to an end. The mystery completed at the last trumpet. And what happens immediately, according to John's vision in, in Revelation 14, immediately after that wheat harvest, immediate, without commentary, the gathering of the grapes. On the last day, in that last hour, the redeemed will be caught up and the, the terrible, terrible wine press of the fury of God takes place. Revelation 15, 1. Let's begin. And I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. Again, I think language is very important. These last plagues complete, accomplish God's stored up wrath. In one bowl of wrath poured out after another, God's wrath, his unleashed anger upon the earth. He is expending himself of every last ounce of wrath as he burns up this world. And what happens at the last bowl on the last day? A giant, great world quake where every island is removed from its place, every mountain is brought down, utter destruction upon the earth. Now, here's the good news. We are not here for that. It's my opinion that in these last moments of judgment, the Bible calls it the hour. I'll talk about that in a minute. We're not here. The wheat harvest has been completed. And once the wheat is taken out and gathered into the barns, then the grape harvest begins, the dreadful day of the Lord's wrath. And we are not here. The hour of his judgment has come upon the earth. Do you remember Jesus was asked again, Matthew 24, tell us what will be the signs of your coming at the end of the age? No man knows the day or the hour. Jesus would say about the thief in the night, I'm coming in an hour that you don't know. Only the Father in heaven knows. And uh, we will... We have just heard the angel, the first angel flying midair. Fear God, give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Can I suggest something to you? I'm not trying to split hairs linguistically, 
But I'm not sure that what this means is that these bowls of wrath will all take place in an hour. In fact, as you read the bowls of, of, of wrath, it sure sounds like it takes a little while, not just one hour. Well, then is the hour symbolic? Couldn't it mean this? Go back to Jesus. No man knows the day or the hour. Couldn't it mean no man knows what date on the calendar it will happen or the hour it commences? You see, there is a day marked on the calendar and there is an hour there will be a moment people will look back on history and we've just come through um, the remembrance of, uh, is it the 20th year anniversary of September 11th? The hour that that plane hit, that first tower, indelibly marked in history, September 11th. And I don't know, maybe some of you know, the hour, it was, it was what? 8.45, September 11th. And so... It's possible that these last bowls of wrath don't happen in a literal 24-hour day or on a 60-minute hour. It just means that the calendar date has been revealed when it commences and the hour uh, marks the start of these bowls of wrath. We are going to be spared that hour. When that calendar date comes and that hour commences, we will not be here. We will have been taken out. And it was the promise the Spirit made to the church at Philadelphia. I'm going to ask you to go back to Revelation 3. Remember the, our discussion about the letters of the churches. I believe they were literal letters to real churches in Asia, seven of them, but just like the sequence of sevens in the book of Revelation, I think they were also used as a template, even a timetable of end times events. The language that Jesus uses as he addresses those angels of those churches, by the way, seemed to indicate uh, that, that his coming is speedily on its way. Uh, I'm going to come. It's almost time for me to appear. Uh, I, I'm coming soon until he gets to Laodicea. Here I am. I'm standing at the door. And I believe that they represent the seven years of tribulation and the things that the church will endure during those seven years. But here's his promise to this faithful church at Philadelphia. Uh, beginning in verse 7 of chapter 3, to the angel of the church at Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you since you have kept my command to endure patiently. I will also keep you, look at this, from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Again, let me suggest that there is a time that only God knows, a calendar date that only God knows. But when that first bowl of wrath is unleashed, we will be gone <clears throat> because the church has been promised. We will be spared. We will not have to endure that hour when it is poured out upon the earth because it's not for us. It is coming on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. John 15, let's go on. John has a vision of heaven, the throne room of God. 
Next week, we're going to spend a little more time looking at the interesting study, the interesting theology of the temple of God in heaven. There is a temple of God in heaven where he resides, the throne room of God, where there is the sea of glass, where the Ark of the Covenant is. Um, I don't have time today to talk about it, but I, I promise you we will next week. Revelation 15, verse 2, And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire, standing beside the sea, though those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name. They held harps given them by God and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. John has a vision of, of the redeemed standing in the presence of God. They were all given harps, and they sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. By the way, let me just pause here a minute. <clears throat> Through uh, my own experience as a boy, as I'm trying to figure out heaven and what's that going to look like, and as I've talked to hundreds of people through the years, I can tell you many people are not excited about going to heaven. They are not, going, they are not excited about going to heaven because they will say to me almost almost using the exact phrase, what fun is it sitting on a cloud playing a harp? Have you, have you had that worry yourself? I don't know. Maybe not. But their total definition of heaven, this, this close, their total definition, I'm going to go to heaven, be issued a harp, and you go to cloud number 34, you're stuck there forever, and... Yeah. Practice and sing. Plunk, plunk, plunk. One millennium gone. Ten millennium gone. A billion years gone. It has created in some, and there's a scientific name for this, a fear of heaven, a fear of eternity. Do any of you have that? A fear of claustrophobia. Okay, all right. Heaven's going to be fun for the first zillion years. But then it's got to get boring, doesn't it? And I can't get out. I can't escape. Have you been to Disney World? You've been to Disney World? I wouldn't say Disney World's heaven by any stretch. But a child going to Disney World so excited, at what point would a child get absolutely bored with Disney World? Please, Mama, please don't make me go back into the Magic Kingdom again. Please. I've ridden, I've ridden Space Mountain 10,000 times. I'm done with it. I've been on the It's a Small World boat a zillion times. Please don't make me listen to that song again. I'm done with Disney after a day. And so in our finite minds, we think, no matter how good it is, no matter how wonderful it will be, no matter if I have been, been in reunion with my family again, I might get sick and tired of them again like I did on earth. I went out of here. There is this notion that we're all going to be called up to heaven collectively. Some of you that were in the armed forces, do you remember the day when you were issued your, the, the GI issue? You all got in line. Next, you had your hair, hair cut. Next, you got your your clothes. Next, you get your shots. I don't know which order that happens. Uh, then you're given your weapons and you're given your post. And before you know it, your head's been cut. Your arms are hurting because of shots. You got a weapon in your hand. Uh, your head's spinning. What's next? What's next? Same thought about heaven. They were going to be in this big line. Next! White robe. Next! Harp. Next! There's your, your cloud. And before you know it, <laughs> Plunk, plunk. Is this what I was looking forward to? You know where that notion comes from? From this chapter. They were given harps. Now it doesn't say they're on a cloud. We've been caught up in a cloud, but we're in the throne room of God. This is just day one. This is not... This is not this repetitive like the movie Groundhog Day. You don't wake up to the same event every day. Oh, heaven is going to be fantastic, unspeakable. 
No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has in store. If you got a problem with heaven, get over it. It's going to be fantastic. But if you need some help, I want you to think of the alternative. Maybe that'll put it in a different perspective for you. But John has a vision of this great throng with harps and singing around the throne, and they're singing a very specific song. They are singing the song of Moses. I'm going to, I'm going to sing it in its entirety to you here in just a minute. They are singing the song of Moses. He goes on in verse, uh, verse 3. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways. King of the nations, who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Those around the throne singing with their harps are singing the ancient song of Moses. For centuries, Jewish people have sung that song. They have sung it in worship as they sang the Psalms of David. The collection of that ancient hymn book would have included this most revered song, the song of Moses. And the song of Moses was sung by the Jewish people, I believe supernaturally, put in their mouths after they had crossed the Red Sea, safely escaping the armies of Pharaoh. And they were, they were so amazed at God's supernatural deliverance. Think about it for a minute. How would you feel? You are backed up to the vast Red Sea. The entire army of Egypt is, is barreling towards you. You know it is going to be a bloodbath. You are literally between a rock and a hard place. No escape. No escape. Moses puts his staff into the, into the Red Sea and it parts. Moses says, hurry and cross. And in mass... The Hebrew people crossed over on dry ground and on either side of them like a wall. The sea had rolled back by the breath of God and they passed safely over. They are shocked. They are going through that miraculous passageway unable to think or breathe as they are going through under the protective mighty majestic hand of God. They get to the other side and they witness Pharaoh's army boldly going through that same corridor. And when the whole army is in the middle of the sea, God releases his hold on those waves and they're swallowed up. And then they sing this song from Exodus 15. Some of the most familiar words to Jewish people. I will sing to the Lord, for he's highly exalted, both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. I'm being accompanied by music. Do you hear that? <laughs> the Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God. I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Let me stop right here. This is what you will be singing one day in heaven with a harp in your hand, surrounded with your loved ones who have gone before an innumerable number of the redeemed. This is what you're going to be singing. You should practice. You should, you should learn these words. Verse 3, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw that threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed like them like stubble. 
by the blast of your nostrils, the water, waters piled up. The surging waters stood up like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy boasted, I'll pursue. I will overtake them. I will divide the spoils. I will gorge myself on them. I will draw my sword and my hand will destroy them. But you blew your breath and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? You stretch out your hand and the earth swallows your enemies. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall on them. By the power of your arm, they will be still as stone until your people pass by, Lord, until the people you brought pass by. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, your hands established. This is the song of Moses sung by the Hebrews looking back across the Red Sea, safely gathered, headed to the promised land. But it's interesting to me they don't just sing about what they just saw. They sing about what's coming. When the nations <clears throat> will be gripped by terror. The great kings of the earth gripped by terror by what's coming. When the redeemed pass them by. I, I, I'm not, I, I can't be very specific right here, but I wish you would just allow me to tell you what I think, that the people of the earth left behind, so to speak, on the day of the Lord will be gripped by terror when we pass them by, because as we will see in Revelation chapter 19, the head of the army, this mighty deliverer, is the Lamb. Isn't it interesting that John says they sang the song of Moses and the Lamb. For centuries, Jewish people have sung the song of Moses to God, Yahweh, Jehovah. But this song was in, intended futuristically to be sung in heaven by the redeemed of all ages, Jewish converts to Christianity, Gentile converts to Christianity, together around the throne, singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. The Lamb was present at the Red Sea. Jesus was present there. Moses didn't see it. Moses didn't call him Jesus. But God was there. The Son was there. The great deliverer, Jesus, had to do with the children of Israel passing safely through those waters. The Song of Moses is predictive. It's future telling. Because before that song ends, mankind is looking back on the great destruction, not of the Red Sea, but of Armageddon. The great destruction when in a blood bath, the armies of Egypt, so to speak, who had kept world in sin and slavery are defeated by the breath of his mouth. They will burn like stubble. This is a song that we will sing around the throne, looking back upon time. And it is predictive because it, 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 it's, it says very, very clearly in verse 17, you will bring them to the mountain of your inheritance. The mountain of your inheritance, Zion, Jerusalem. So let me, let me get back to what I'm suggesting. Do you remember when we looked at the seals? The sixth seal is the day of the Lord. And the kings of the earth, 
cry in the midst of this great world quake for the mountains to fall upon them. Hide us, hide us from the face of the Lamb. As they are dying, they are stricken with terror because they see the Lamb. And I believe they see us passing by. Revelation 19 says, the Lord is at the head of his army, King of kings, Lord of lords. Who is that army? That heavenly army coming down from heaven, down from the clouds. We are with him as we fly to earth, first to Jerusalem, then north to Israel, and then to northern Israel to Armageddon. We are part of that army that saves Jerusalem, part of the army that saves Armageddon. Again, actually, we were just witnesses watching Christ do it. We are the army. It's not an army of angels. It's you and me. In our new bodies, and the people of the earth will tremble when fear, when they see the Lamb and in his train, the army of heaven that will include you and me and the church of all ages. They will tremble when we pass by. What is sight that will be, by the way? When the coming with great clouds of glory and every eye will see him. I, I can't explain how in one spot everyone on the earth will see, but every eye will see not only Christ coming in clouds, but the armies of heaven. Millions? It will be the most terrifying scene in the history of man when it happens at the last hour on the last day. Verse 18, and the Lord will then reign forever and ever. Let me very quickly conclude chapter 15. Verse 5, after this I looked and I saw in heaven the temple, that is the tabernacle of the covenant law, and it was opened. Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chest. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power. No one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. There is this scene in heaven, and it is though the world is, is being told, brace yourself, here it comes. Brace yourself. Believers, it's about time for you to be taken out of the way. It's time for God's fury to be unleashed. And there is this solemn moment in heaven. As I'll talk about next week, I think this correlates. We saw this earlier in the book of Revelation, that there was silence in heaven for the space of a half an hour. Do you remember that? I think there is this solemn moment, catch your breath, quiet please. And in that quietness, seven angels step forth and they receive seven deadly bowls. God's wrath is about to be poured out. He is going to avenge every wrong and the earth will never be the same. Quiet in his presence as this deadly last chapter begins to unfold. And it is deadly. It is terrifying. Thank God we are not here for it. It's not meant for us, this day, this hour of wrath. Not meant for us, but for those in the last days, in the last hour. So uh, <clears throat> next week, we will talk 
On next Happy Thursday, we will, we will talk about the bowls of wrath and what they look like and how they will terrify and afflict mankind. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us online. Could we close with prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word again. We thank you for your word. We, th we thank you for the supernatural symmetry of it. Start to finish. It um, is meant to make sense. It is meant to be placed in an understanding, an understandable order. Thank you for giving us the time to, uh, to journey in it, to look at these pieces of a majestic puzzle, to put them in their right place. Holy Spirit, would you help us make sense of it? Would you protect my lips from errant teaching? I don't want to say what you don't want me to say. I don't, I don't want to teach what I, I want to teach, but what you want me to say. And so would you guide us all, not only in the speaking of it, but the hearing of it. Would you throw out anything that isn't right, that doesn't fit, that doesn't really make sense, that is just just the, uh, the meanderings of, 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 of man. We just want to hear your truth. And once we hear it, we want to know that it's the truth. And then, Lord, would you equip us with these lessons to be able to teach this to a, a dark, unsaved world? Make the passion of prophecy, the passion that burns in us, so that it will motivate us to reach the lost before the great and dreadful day of the Lord's wrath. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you. Thank you all so much.